figured I would tell you the other thing that happened with that other strand of AI. Um, so people also figured out some more math about neural networks. Um, they figured out, hey, if we just have the circles there, we got circles, those circles, they aren't, uh, they stand for neurons. Um, and they figured out, if you don't have that intermediate layer, there are a lot of things you can't do. So your brain, turns out, isn't just one neuron, talks to another, gives an output. Um, there are layers of these things. And once you add in that extra layer, you can actually do some pretty amazing things. So one thing the post office wants, um, it has as well, but it wanted back when it, before it had it, was uh, a way to automatically read zip codes. So lots of zip codes and letters, you want to sort things quickly, um, so it needs an automatic way to read it. So this is a program um, that has a neural net, so it's basically a neural net working, has lots of little layers, um, the different rows represent, different columns represent different layers. And it takes an input image like that, and you see the five isn't exactly perfect, it's got some spaces, but it's still able to recognize answer 145. Um, so there's sort of, some people, actually neural nets are coming back into vogue in some ways in AI now, but um, I would say these ideas of inserting more numeric probabilities um, and mathematics and AI really helped it to surmount some of the problems with just having a small world, where it looked like things would be really good, but they didn't scale up well. So, all right, now you know a little bit of history of AI. Let's take a look at what we might want AI to do. So there are lots of things you might want AI to do. Um, this is a little list from Wikipedia. Um, so one thing is planning. So you wanna figure out, if I have a goal, how do I actually accomplish that goal? I need to figure out what sequence of actions to take. I had to figure out how to get from my last class to here in Evans. And even though I knew where both of them were, I had to, for instance, couldn't just take a straight line, I had to find the doors. There's some planning involved. Um, learning, and in particular machine learning, so I think this is one of the most exciting parts, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, but one of the other big things that helps with AI is if you don't have to program everything. It's really nice if you can just make the system figure out what to do. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some ways to do that. Natural language processing, understanding language and generating language. Um, Things surrounding motion and manipulation. So at first you think, eh, motion, that's not that hard. Um, <laughs> then you start things like programming a robot, and eh, it's bad if when it's trying to reach behind it, it stabs itself. Um, that's a problem. Um, so you have to, that requires both planning and thinking about how to move things. Um, perception, so if I get an array of pixels, I need to interpret that. Um, so I recognize there are a bunch of people, there are seats, but how does a computer do that? Um, and then creativity and general intelligence are things one might want to do that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but you can think about them. Um, okay, so as I'm touring these AI applications, you might think about how you would evaluate how well a machine performed at a task. Um, so does it need to be perfect, or is it good enough if it's pretty good? Um, so with the zip codes, you really want to have very high accuracy because there's tons and tons of mail being delivered each day. If you even a small percentage of that, you're sorting to the wrong place, you're gonna have lots of delays. Um, might be that if I just want the system to try to detect a few events and I can then go through them by hand, maybe it's not so important that it be totally accurate. Um, and then you could also be thinking about where you would draw the line between intelligent and non-intelligent behavior. And we're gonna come back to that question at the end. So, um, as I said, I adapted these slides from Dan Garcia, and I'm told that you may have seen this slide before. Um, so this is about planning. Um, so I mentioned one of the simplest applications of planning is the idea of getting from here to there. Um, you see this in video games a lot. You have a non-player character, the computer controls. And if it doesn't have a very smart planner, it might, for instance, get stuck behind a wall. Let's say I've, I'm trying to go here, um, and the video game character says, basically the algorithm might be, always go somewhere where you get closer to the goal. And that sounds sort of reasonable. I always try to get closer to where I'm going. But if I've got a corner here, I could get stuck here. Anywhere I go, I'm gonna get farther. Um, how do I get there? <laughs> so that's, you might call that a low uh, range of intelligence, um, sort of simple heuristics. You can do better than that. Um, so there are algorithms that both take into account heuristic information, so they are guided by the idea that getting closer is better, but they look for a whole path. So they look for actually being able to get to the goal versus just in the next step getting closer. Um, and that works pretty well. You've probably still seen some bad AIs uh, in games, but hopefully they are getting better. Um, and when done well, they actually can work quite well. Um, 
There's also an idea of planning in terms of not just getting from here to there, but planning out, say, how hard should this game be? You want a game that's not too hard, um, but not too easy. So you don't want something that a novice player starts, can never get anywhere, they die immediately. That, that's no fun for anyone. Um, you also don't want an expert player comes in and they just beat it immediately. Um, so one thing I was reading as so I was preparing for this lecture, I was reading about a tennis playing AI, where basically it figures out, watches how you play, and figures out how good you are, um, and then tries to plan out actions that will be of an optimal level of difficulty, where it thinks sometimes you'll succeed at hitting the ball back, sometimes you'll fail. And that's sort of a much more difficult problem, I would say, um, than just getting from here to there. Um, but it is a cool problem to work on. Um, okay. So I'm not actually going to talk much about games in this lecture, um, but they are a really neat area of research. So machine learning sounds like sort of a nebulous term. You can basically define it as a program learns if after an experience it performs better. Pretty simple. So if after something happens it does better at some task, um, it changes the way it responds, then we can say it's learned in some way. So one easy application you probably all use every day is spam filtering. Even if you don't know you use it, university does some of it. Um, and with spam filtering, the computer was trained. It saw lots of instances of emails that are spam, spam lots of instances of emails that aren't spam. And it had to learn to make the right generalizations. So it couldn't learn these are the only things in the world that are spam. That wouldn't be useful. What you want is it for it to perform better now when it sees a new novel email it's never seen before. You want it to then perform better. Um, and so that way of training a machine learning algorithm where you give it this, these are examples of this, these are examples of this, figure it out, that's called supervised learning. Um, and it basically produces a classifier. There are lots of different instances of this. So you might have seen, um, for instance, some object recognition things. So computer learns to pick out of images. These are where all the people are. Um, so I think some people's cameras now even have this, um, where it'll put a little box around the face. Um, and that's kind of cool. <laughs> so that's an example where somebody said, here are all the faces, and it figures out what, what are the right features for that. Um, an example that I'm interested in, um, and if you've seen Khan Academy, um, which basically teaches people things online, uh, they watch videos, it's a pretty neat place, um, and they do different exercises. And for a while they had said, well, the way we figure out whether people know this or they don't know it is if they get 10 in a row right, then we say that they're done, they've learned this topic, let's move on. Um, but that's really frustrating if, say, you get nine in a row right and then you make a typo. Like, no one wants that. So they want to do a better way. And so they realize we have lots of data. Um, we have all these students doing practice problems, say some arithmetic problems. Let's just tell the computer which of these series um, the student got the next problem right, when they got the next problem wrong. And so it's, again, an instance of supervised learning, um, and it's now out there on the web being used. So machine learning sounds like, eh, that's sort of complex. Maybe it doesn't get used. Maybe if it works, it's not actually AI. But this is actually, these things get used all the time. So it's one thing. Just because something works doesn't mean it's not AI. <laughs> um, 